who is he to you? Is he your redeeming lamb? Or is he the rewarding avenger? Who is he to you? So, you know, I just go down through there and try to share stuff. And then obviously you guys know we're going to look at uh, this section here. These next uh, 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 descriptions, names, titles, descriptions. This comes from the Alleluia Chorus through to the end of the book. Chapter 19 is the Alleluia Chorus and the two suppers, right? And then I always tell folk there's two suppers that are found in the book of Revelation. There's the supper that you can be eating at, right? And then there's a supper where you could be eaten. Which one will you be found at? Just something to think of. I just like to, you know, to help folk to think because I just, well, that's just what I like to do. If I can help other <laughs> folk to think, it just makes life a lot simpler for, for me <laughs> as the pastor. If I can get other folk to read the Bible and think about it, it'll just, so here we see Christ with the Alleluia Chorus and the Suppers. This is how he's found. He's the God of glory, the God of honor, power, salvation. He's true and righteous. He's the judge, the avenger. He's the one that the beast and elders fall down and worship. He's, the, he's worthy of praise, worthy of servants. He's the Lord God. He's omnipotent. He reigns. Uh, he's the husband, the lamb, the one to get ready for. He's Jesus. He's uh, faithful and true. He judges in righteousness. He's the warrior. He's the one with the eyes as a flame of fire. This is all still chapter 19. He is the one crowned with many crowns, the name written, a secret name. He's clothed. He's got the vesture dipped in blood. He's, you know, he's all of this. Chapter 20, he's this right here. He's Jesus. He's the one with the witness to die for. He's the one you live with, the one you reign with, the Christ. He's God. He's the one that has priests, the one who sends down fire from heaven. He's the devourer. You see what I'm talking about? And I just go down through the book. So you can get that idea. That's good enough for that for now. Uh, let me go back here a little bit. And uh, so when we're back in the book of Revelation, I've already shared these with you. We're not going to spend much time uh, in them at all. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, uh, we looked at this, uh, I think, in December uh, of last year. So now... Uh, I get to another idea of how to give an exposition of the scripture. Uh, now, I believe we should always go through it uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. You know what I mean? I just, that's just me. Not that I don't do topical preaching and stuff, but this class is about advanced exposition of scripture. Okay. So when we're going to be doing something like this, I like to just go through it book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, section by section, however that's going to come together, okay? So we have in chapter two, four churches. In chapter three, there'll be three churches. Here we have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. So what I did was I put down Ephesus. You read that section, and we're giving it to the church family, and we have the introduction is found in verse one. Then I put down pros, cons, promises. If you look over here, Smyrna is verses 8 to 11. Introduction, pros, cons, promises. Then you have chapter uh, 2, or yeah, chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. Pergamus, introduction, pros, cons, promises. I do the exact same thing for all seven churches. Let's look at the, the introduction to the church. Then let's look at the pros, the cons, and the promises given. And I do that throughout the whole thing. The repetitive verses that you find here, they're always going to be, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Four times you're going to find that in chapter two. Okay. So uh, when you go down through here, I put their pros, right? Thy works, labor, pay, just put little notes down. Their cons for Ephesus, they left their first love. There you go. You know, over here, 
pros for Smyrna, thy works, tribulation, uh, cons. Well, I don't have anything there. Maybe you'll need to go and look at that book and see what you come up with. But it looks to me like uh, when he's writing to the church at Smyrna, there were no cons. Some to think of. Then Thyatira, well, Pergamus, pros, cons. Thyatira, pros, cons. And you notice that these verses will skip around, like over here in Ephesus. The pros are found in verses 2 and 3, and then in verse 6. Uh, let me just see. I think it's going to be in the next set that we go to. So then I went over here and I put down the key, uh, the repetitive verse. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, right? So I put down key thoughts, right? A key thought about the church of Ephesus. This is just me. When I'm preaching, what is it that I get out of it, right? He that standeth in the midst of the seven, I will remove thy can. Repent. Repent, man. In the second uh, church, the church in Smyrna, he that was dead now is alive, saith he that overcometh will not be heard of the second death. Amen. The church in Pergamos, he that hath the two-edged sword, saith, repent, or else I will fight against them with my mouth. And then the church in Thyatira, he that is the picture of judgment, standing in the midst of the churches, saith, I see it all. I know what is happening. You hold fast till I come. And then I preach on the white stone. Now, you see, you're not going to have any notes on the white stone. You'll have to go and look at it or call me uh, and ask me about it. You know, I think that I shared some of it last year with you. But, you know, you just study and try and find out what the white stone represents, uh, how you would get it its historical significance uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, judgment uh, between different parties, just stuff like that, okay? So that's another way to do it. Chapter three is going to be the same, uh, the same uh, format, just so that you'll get an idea. I put it down the same way, three churches, intro, pros, cons, promises. Intro, pros, cons, promises. Intro. Sir, what is the, sir, what is the number point, number three point, introduction and pros? What is the number three, once again? Uh, promises, pros, yeah. cons. Cons, oh, what is that? That's like pros are things that they're doing good. Your okay. pros. Number three. Cons are cons. things that I have against you, cons. Oh, since, is it since actually? You you mean it yes. like iniquities or yes. since? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pros okay. are what you're doing good. Cons are what you're doing negative. Okay, okay, then, okay. Yeah, then promises. Okay, yes, sir. Okay. Amen. And uh, so pros, cons, and then promises. So I put the exact same format for chapter three. And then I put the repetitive verses, which are the same, and then the key thoughts on each one. The key thought on Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. You know, this way you get the idea. And then I put uh, uh, where the cons in chapter two dealt with leaving your first love, having false teachers and teaching going on. The cons in chapter three dealt with folk thinking there's something when they're not. There were no cons written about the church in persecution. That was the church at Smyrna. No cons were written about that church. Neither were there cons written about the church of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Six out of the seven churches had pros. Six. All six had works in common. The only church with no pros at all was the church of the Laodiceans. Just stuff that you think of when you're going through the book and you just read and you read and you read and you say, man, there's nothing good said about the church of the Laodiceans. And the reason why I put of in parentheses, it's just a thought that some preachers have had 
that the reason why there's no prose is because it's not the church at Laodicea, it's the church of the Laodiceans. It's just a worldly church. There are no pros. You know, that's not necessarily my thought. I just put that there so that it always keeps that in my mind that some folk consider that to be definitive. Now, you could maybe say that that's definitive in the book of Revelation, but you can't say that that's definitive of all of the letters written to the churches because if I'm right, and I'm pretty positive I'm right, uh, Thessalonians, uh, the Bible says the church of the Thessalonians, uh, yeah, it says Paul, Silvanus, Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians. And we know that the church at Thessalonica was one of the best churches ever. Okay, so that's why I put it in quotes here, because some folk like to say that, that it's a worldly church, it's a church of the people instead of a church of God. But you cannot say that and not qualify it only to the book of Revelation. Because if you don't qualify it only to the book of Revelation, then I'm going to open up my Bible and show you Thessalonians, where the Bible says very clearly it's the church of the Thessalonians. And they're like a model church. Just something to think of. Okay. I like to, you know, because I want to share things with you as I go. That way we all. No, because you may have the same thoughts that I have, or you may have heard some of the things that I have heard, and I would like to just clarify with you where I think, and you know, and just that way you get an idea. So then you get into Revelation chapter four, okay? And uh, let me uh, let me get over here with my notes because I'm way off. I printed up a a book so that I could keep up with myself on paper here with you. So I just put all of these together. In chapter number four, we're going to see the, uh, the throne of God, okay? And, uh, and now we have a whole different way that we're going to study it, because now it's not pros, cons, promises. So, and that's why I wanted to do Revelation with you, because as you go through the book, you'll find that you're doing an exposition of Scripture, but you're not following one set formula to do it. We have one way that we looked at chapter one. Then we have another way that we looked at chapters two and three. And now we're switching and we're going to look at another way to look at chapter four. You see, when I did chapter four, I did it in a series of questions. Okay. Uh, in, in this throne of God, which is chapter four, 11 verses, we see that it is, uh, I, I put it together in a, an entire series of questions, right? There's an invitation. Where is it? And when you get to chapter four of the book of Revelation, after this, I looked and behold, the door was open in heaven. And the first voice I heard was of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither. I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Okay. Now, so I put it in a series of questions. In verse one, my question is, where is it? Right? Where is the throne of God? Well, it's up hither. It says, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard was a trumpet saying, uh, talking with me, which said, come up hither. I will show thee. So my very first question, where is the throne of God? It's up hither. How do you get there? Well, that's found in verse two. Immediately, I was in the spirit. How do you get there? Well, you get there by being in the spirit. Where is there? Well, that's the throne that's in heaven. Verse three, what is the setting? What is the setting of the throne? If I'm, if I'm going to go up hither, and the only way there is through the spirit, and that's where the throne is, 
Well, what is the setting of the throne? Well, right here, it says that it is a glorious one seated on the throne, verse 3. When I got there, what was the setting? Well, there was somebody sitting there who was like to look upon a jasper and star sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne like in sight unto an emerald. So it's a glorious one that is seated upon the throne. And then what is the attire? What is the attire? Verse 4, round about the throne, because you could ask, who is there with this entity? Then you would put down the, uh, the four, and uh, there, there's four and 20 seats, four and 20 elders. And how are they attired? Well, they're in, attired in white raiment. They have crowns of gold on their, so I just went through the whole chapter like that. What is the attire? Verse five, what is taking place? There's lightnings, thunderings, voices, voices, and seven lamps are burning. Who or what else is there in the throne? Well, the sea of glass is there. The four beasts are there. Well, what do they look like? Verse 7, they look like a lion, a calf, a man. And, and all these are, I want you to understand this. All these are, are thoughts that, that I will develop and be preaching every verse. I don't just go through and give, you know, this is this, and this is that, and this is this, and this is that. These are just basic very basic, simple thought processes. I'll, I'll be preaching on, you know, where is it? It's up hither. You know what I mean? Heaven, you know, that's just what it, and how do you get, man, you got to be in the spirit to get there. You got to be saved. The spirit of God must abide inside of you. You know, you, you have to be one of his own, you know, you see what I'm talking about. And then uh, the setting, the glorious one said, who is more glorious than the lamb slain for sinners? Who is more worthy? You see what? And, and I preach every verse. All this is that you're looking at on this sheet right here, or that you get notes of, all that is, is very basic outline. That's it. All it does is keep my thoughts focused. That's it. And then I just start preaching. Just, just start preaching and lay it out before the folk, however God is putting it in my heart to develop it before the people that I'm with. Because see, sometimes, well, all the time, it just changes. It's not that God's word changes. It's not that the way to God changes. It's not that who God changes, uh, who God is that changes. It's not that at all. It's the people that I'm working with God may want me to bring out something else to this particular group. You know, you just, I try to be what we call fluid. Whatever God wants, just pour me into the mold and help me to be a blessing to as many folk as I can. Okay. So, so who or what else is there? Uh, what else do they do? They give honor, glory, thanks, verse 10. Uh, what do the elders do? They fall down, they worship, they cast their crowns before the throne. What is being said in the throne of God? Thou art worthy. Thou hast created. You see what I mean? And to preach on the worthiness of our God. And you know what I mean? And uh, I mean, you have to understand what I just did with you in three minutes. I might preach for 35 or 45 minutes and just go to town. I love it. You know, I mean, I just, I love it. Okay. Here are some thoughts that I put down about this uh, throne of God, right? Just some thoughts. Uh, this is how I'm doing that chapter. It's going to be done by questions. Then I have these thoughts, right? You enter the throne of God in the hereafter. It says, after this, I looked and behold the door. In order to go higher, you've got to begin by looking. And the Bible says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. So I would be preaching on how to get set. In order to go higher, you have to see the door. There's a door set. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Right? And then there's the first voice that is heard is that of a trumpet. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. 
the dead in Christ shall rise first. How quickly do you get to the hereafter? The Bible says, immediately I was in the spirit. Immediately I was in the spirit. I was in the throne room of God. There's no intermediate stage between life here and life there. Okay, uh, so you, and you see, you can bring all of this out. You can start preaching it and helping people so that they realize these things that you were wherever you're going. It's determined right now on this side of the grave. It's determined. There is no uh, soul sleep period. There is no intermediate stage where you might decide to repent. No, whatever you decided right here, that's where you end up. Either you're going to end up in heaven or you're going to end up in hell to be cast later into the lake of fire. It's real simple. Okay. So how quickly do you get there? Immediately. Immediately. The only way shown here to enter the throne is if you're in the spirit. That's the only way that's shown. In chapter number four, the only way shown to enter the throne of God is to be in the spirit and to see the door, and to be carried up thither. That's it. This is good. You guys get this, right? This is good stuff, man. You got to be kidding me, right? When you look and behold, see the door, and hear the call, you know, what's your response? And that's my conclusion, and that's what I'll do. I'll just preach this thing, preach about the throne room of God, then I go right into chapter number five. I just keep working my way through, Amen. And, uh, and you guys can see this all right on the screen. Correct. You can see this, right? You do see what I'm showing you. It's on there, right? No, sir. What do you mean? No, sir. I'm doing all of this and you're not seeing it. Yeah. Hang I on. Can't see. Sure. We You don't see this. Well, yes, I see sir. It. You do see it? No, sir. A blank, a, a blank a screen we can see. Now can you see this? Yes, yes, yes. yes we can. Oh, we can man. See. You mean I've been doing this the whole time and you're not even seeing what I'm looking at? Man, I did not know that. I don't know what happened. Oh, well, I'm very sorry. Man. You guys can interrupt me anytime and say, hey, preacher, we don't see a thing. <laughs> Amen. You, you're you not going to bother me. Uh, I don't really see these chats, okay? Uh, I know that somebody has done a chat, uh, but uh, that's all right. Uh, so chapter five, man, I am so sorry. You guys can stop me anytime. Just say, preacher, we're not seeing anything. Okay, <laughs> man. Okay, so, oh, what a bummer. Because I'm sitting here thinking that you guys are looking at exactly what I'm looking at. You do see it now, right? Okay, that's fine. You do see this now. So what I have is... Uh, Chapter one, we just divided it up into a little way. Chapter two and three, man, did you guys get to see chapter two and three with me? No, sir. Oh, man. Okay. I don't know what happened. Uh, here, I, I'm, I know what I'm going to do, though. We're going to just do this right now. Let me go back, and that way I can pull it up and just show it to you. I am so sorry, guys. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. It just, right now, it says that it's paused. As soon as I did that, it said I'm paused. I'm so sorry. There we go. Okay. My fault. The whole thing. You ready? Here you go, fellas. Now you can see it. Man, that's just so sad. Uh, okay, here you go. What I do is I took chapter two. I did the churches. Uh, there were four of them, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira. Excuse me. I put down each church, the introduction, the pros, the cons, the promises. 
the introduction, the pros, the cons, the promises. I am so sorry, you guys. Makes me feel horrible. I will tell you this. I believe that all of this is in December's uh, uh, classes that we did. I think that all of this is in there. Did you guys get to see when I was doing all of the names, titles, and descriptions of Christ? Awesome. No. Well, you guys have missed the whole the whole first 40 minutes. Uh, I am I'm not going to go back. I'm not gonna go back. Uh, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's uh, let's move forward from here, and uh, and I'm very sorry that I messed this up. I don't know why my screen was not sharing. I just I don't know why. When I click on it up here, it just says your screen is paused. And today I moved my camera over, and. Uh, and that's probably what it is. I just couldn't see where it was saying your screen is paused. I'm so no sorry. problem. Let's let's go forward. Yeah, let's go forward. So, uh, chapter two. This way, you get the idea of what it was I was telling you about. Then I put key thoughts for each church. Then I would go in from here. Yeah. See, now it says my screen is paused again. That's all right. I'm going to get it. Don't you worry. Uh, chapter three, there is a way for me to do this, and I'm going to figure it out. There you go, chapter three, same exact format in chapter three. I just put the churches down, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. I write the intro, the pros, the cons, and the promises, okay? And what I was telling y'all before, because, well, I just, I can't believe that it wasn't showing you this, but that's all right. The pros are found in chapter two or verse two, uh, A means the beginning, and then verse four. And then the cons are found in verse one, B, which is the end of verse one and verse two. And the promises are found in verses three and five. Okay. And uh, then I put down the repetitive verses and the key thought for each church. And then I put down some different things that you see. Okay. Uh, and I'm just putting this up here real quick. It'll be in the, uh, the recorded notes and it is in last semester's work. So I'm going to keep moving forward. Uh, I think as soon as I close this, it's going to do away with my screen sharing. Uh, yeah, it has. See, now it's actually printing something up there for me. Uh, let me see. There, now we'll go to chapter four. There it is. And we're screen sharing now. So this is the uh, where I said that it's the throne of God. It's set in a series of questions. I just gave, where is the throne of God? How do you get there? What is the setting? What is the attire of those there? What is taking place? What else is there? A sea of glass, the beast. What do they look like, right? What do they do? Uh, what do the elders do? What do they say? These are the various things that are going on there. That's when I gave you these thoughts. You enter the throne of God, you know, uh, looking in the hereafter. You go higher uh, by looking. In order to go higher, you have to see the door. The first voice you hear is that of a trumpet. You know, and I put all these verses here, the ones that I was quoting to you earlier, they're all right here. How quickly do you get there immediately? The only way shown is if you're in the spirit, you know, and uh, I just, I hate that that wasn't up there for you to see, but that's okay. I'm going to get all this back. It's going to work. Don't you worry. Then we go into chapter five. See, it's, uh, it's, it's screen sharing now. Uh, oh, hang on, because that's already open somewhere. 
it's not going to let me open that one because I already have it open. Uh, let me do stop share, and then I'm going to open up it here. One, two, three, four, five. There it is. When you get into chapter number five, all righty, and please forgive me for that. I'm very sorry. When you get into chapter number five, there's 14 verses that are found in the chapter, okay? And, uh, and what I did here was I alliterated it in a very minimal way. Uh, alliteration is when you just try to make stuff rhyme or when you use particular uh, letters. Like for me, it's the book, the beckoning, the weakness, the weeping, the Lord, the lamb, the object, the obeisance, the praise, the priesthood, the multitude, the message, the witness, the worship. Okay, and uh, so you'll find in verse one of chapter five, the book, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book, right, a book written on the, uh, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals, and you have to understand, like when I'm preaching this, friends, I want you to realize that I tell folk what a scroll is, how the seals could be. They could be placed across it this way. They could be placed one after another after another. You can only read so far, and then you have to break another seal to continue reading. And then you have to break another seal to continue reading. After the book is, is written out, they would go back, roll it and seal, roll it and seal, roll it and seal, roll it and seal. And that's why after this, the next seal was open. You see what I'm talking about? And you, you just, you, you preach and you just try to help folk to see uh, the historical significance of it, uh, how things were done in that day. All righty. So you'd be preaching about the book, the beckoning in verse number two. And I saw a strange angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And you see the weakness the weeping, but hallelujah, in verse five, you see the Lord, one of the elders saith unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof, hallelujah for the lamb, amen, so we see the, the Lord in verse five, the lamb in verse six, and, and you just go right on down through here, you just start working. This is a, a, a whole different concept on how to do this advanced exposition, what you would be thinking of, all right? And uh, so then we find that the book is in the hand of God, right? There's none worthy to open the book except for God in the form of the lamb for sinners slain, right? When the worthy one takes the book, the odors of the saints' prayers are to be noticed. That's found in verse 8. These are just thoughts that I, I put down. I have to, I'll, just, I'll keep telling you this again and again. I, I don't ever, that I don't, well, I don't want to say ever. I'll just say, seldom if ever do I write out a sermon. Seldom if ever. I always put uh, guiding thoughts. That's what I do. I try to outline and study and get guiding thoughts, and I'll take notes and write them out sometimes just to spark my mind about a particular thing or subject that's there. But usually all I do is a very basic outline, and I pray. <laughs> <laughs> I pray, God help me, <laughs> amen, I'm serious guys, I'm not kidding, I put a basic outline down, I make sure that I have studied and studied and studied and prayed and prayed and prayed, and then when I get in the pulpit, I just, I say, please God, help me, you know, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to get uh, into a, I don't want to get with, into a group of people and, uh, and be trying to follow a word perfect thing that I've written. I just, 
I want to get there and let God direct me. I may have, I may have uh, five good thoughts about every single verse, but God only wants me to bring out three verses. I will go over every verse. I will give a basic outline to the entire chapter. But when I'm when I'm preaching, God will just, he will just bring out stuff that he wants brought out. It'll be prevalent. I'll know it. And that's what I'm going to preach. So you might hear me preach Revelation chapter five, four times and hear three different main thoughts that I have. Just because maybe I was at this conference preaching this or at this church preaching this or I was in this Bible class bringing this thing out. It's just whatever I feel like God is working. So I don't ever get tied down. I thought, you know, I mean, I have, I have all, all of this stuff, all these notes and everything, but I never get tied to my notes ever. If there's anything you want to be tied to, it's the spirit of God inside of you. That's what you want to be tied to. You can have the greatest outline ever, but if you don't have the Holy Spirit directing you to minister to the people that you're in front of, you've got nothing. Okay? You've got nothing. So that's when you... You spark your mind about the odors of the saints' prayers, okay? Uh, when you think about the odors of the saints' prayers, and now maybe I've sparked your interest, you'll read the book of Revelation and write it down. Every time that you see the saints' prayers or the incense or the odors of saints, and you'll see every time it's found, maybe God will give you an idea of the significance of it, where it's located and why. Huh. Uh, I put down here the basic thoughts on seven churches to this point. And then I gave a, a, just a simple uh, closing thought to everybody that would be there. Chapter one, we've seen Jesus is the authority and uh, we see who Jesus is and the authority that he has. Chapter two, chapter three, his communication of the churches. Chapter four is the throne room. Chapter five, the lamb. Then you move on. You move on and you get into chapter six. Let's see if this will, it will not. See, that's just odd. That's okay. I'm going to get it. I see where it's, uh, where it's paused screen share. So I'm going to bring it right back up. I've got, I'm not going to let this computer whoop me. Amen. <laughs> I'm not going to let this computer uh, hurt me any longer. I, I'm figuring it out now. Amen. You get into chapter six, and now you have the seal judgments, right? And uh, so we've got these seal judgments, and I'm going to have to hustle uh, because it's I've only got 45 minutes left. <laughs> Let's see what we can do, okay? I'm going to just rush through this. And, and now Brother Pungshuk has all of this. I sent it to him in an email, okay? So he has all of these outlines. Uh, in the seal judgments, uh, you see the first seal is the white horse to conquer. The second seal is the red horse takes peace. Uh, the third seal is the black horse who measures trade. The fourth seal is the pale horse who kills in various ways. And then with the fifth seal, now you see the souls of martyrs and you hear the cries and the, uh, the apparel of martyrs is found. In the sixth seal, you have wonders in nature, heavens, topography, and something to wonder at. The seals appear to release the four horsemen, the cries of the martyrs, the shaking of the earth, and the realization of judgment. Okay? You have the beginning of the tribulation period, the judgments of God and his setting up and taking down of the nations of men. That's what you're going to find here. We find uh, the first 
uh, the first seal, I put them all down here, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and, uh, and then the change in tribulation thing, or the change in topography. And then I put on here as a note on the back, the first four would appear to those on the earth as from themselves, like this is something that we did, and not acts of God. The sixth one, just after the cries of the martyrs, is of no doubt understood by those in every walk of life to be directly from the hand of God, although they don't realize that all of these things are orchestrated or permitted by the Almighty God of Heaven. By the time you get to the end of it, they know that those are, okay, just so that you get the idea. Let me see if I can bring up the next one, and it will maybe keep it for me open. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. Well, we're going to get this. So you get into chapter 7. The seal judgments continued. This is where I put the parenthesis. When you read in the book of Revelation, uh, you will want to make sure that you keep in mind that parts of the book are written in parentheses. Uh, you will get events that appear to take place now, but they're not. It's in a parenthesis. This is something that happened before that I'm reminding you of, or this is something that's going to take place that I'm telling you about now, just so that when it happens, you realize it. I say that those are things that are in parentheses, brackets, right? Parenthesis. So between the sixth and seventh seal judgments, these events seemingly take place just before the midpoint of the tribulation. And so what do you have? Well, you have the staying of wrath. Then you have the sealing from wrath, right? So in verses one to three, we find unity in the authority and angels. You have the first four trumpeters of chapter eight. They affect the trees, the earth, the seas, the river, the sun, the moon. Then you have the sealing from wrath, right? Those stamped for security or preservation. And here you have uh, the hallelujah by none other than God himself, right? And uh, just so you get the idea, and I put down the differences in the tribes, okay? Just so that you get the idea of who is included and who is not because there are differences, and you want to be able to try to reconcile these differences. Why is it that we have Manassas here and Dan there? Why is this? What has happened? What has taken place? How are these tribes listed, and what? Because somebody will ask you, okay? So Dan is omitted, and Manasseh takes his place. Joseph is substituted for Ephraim, right? Uh, and then why? Well, Dan is described as a serpent and is the first tribe of the nation to go into idolatry. And then I put Ephraim led in the revolt against Judah. I mean, that's just basic thoughts that I have that I can tell them historically what took place, what happened, maybe why God said this or did that, why, these, why this group and that group are separated, okay? And then uh, I put down here uh, the mixed multitude of martyrs in verses 9 to 13, the term after this. These are those who have been martyred during the first half of the tribulation. Just so that you get that, I just put all of these little notes so that it will spark in my mind if that's what God wants me to bring out in detail. All righty. And then you have the souls of the other previous martyrs being found under the altar. And then you have the, the message and uh, the message of magnificence and meticulous mercy that's found in verses 14 to 17. Okay, so when you go back and you're looking at this, you have the staying of wrath, the sealing from wrath, and then you have the mixed multitude of martyrs, and then it ends with the message of magnificence and meticulous mercy. All righty. And, uh, and I put in here this idea of feeding and the shepherd. I'm sure you guys know these verses. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. 
uh, taking the oversight thereof, uh, not not by constraint, but bit willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And then in Acts where it says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So I just put these thoughts up there. But the basic idea is in this chapter, I, uh, I did alliteration, but I did it in two different ways. The first half I did with S's and W's, the staying of wrath and the sealing from wrath. That's verses one to three and four to eight. But then the second half I did with verses nine to 13 and verses 14 to 17. And I used M's, the mixed multitude of martyrs and the message of magnificence and meticulous mercy. Just to break the chapter up. Then let me see if I can minimize this and do chapter, uh, which one will be on chapter seven, chapter eight. I'll see if it'll let me bring it up now. Yes, sir. Good, 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 good. I'm glad it's starting to work a little bit easier for me. I'm clicking the right buttons. You get into chapter number eight and you read about the trumpet judgments. Okay. And when I'm preaching this, fellas, I read the whole chapter. I just, I read the whole chapter, then I will go back and set it up. I'll say, look, the beginning, we're going to see the preparation of judgment, and then we're going to end with verses 7 to 13 with the product of judgment. So preparation of judgment, verses 1 to 6. I will read all of those verses. I already read them once because I read the chapter. Now I'm going to read them again. Then when I'm done reading them again, I'm going to go back and read each one individually and start preaching. So we find in verse one is the seventh seal, and we see the silence. Verse two, we see the seven angels and the seven trumpets. Verse three, the sacrifice of saints' prayers. Something to think of again. Verse four, the smoke of the sacrifice. Verse five, the sending of the censer. Verse six, the seven angels, seven trumpets preparing to sound. So these, this is all preparation of judgment, okay? This is what's getting ready to happen. This is what's taking place. Chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. I don't believe that we have heard a trumpet yet, okay? I'm pretty positive we haven't heard one yet. No, we sure haven't. It's getting ready to sound, okay? I think it's verse 7 is when they sound, yes. The first angel sounds. That's going to be now. Verse 7 to 13 is the, the beginning of the product of judgment. Verse 7, the sounding of the first angel. Verse 8, the second angel. Verse 9, we see sea creatures, ships. Verse 10 and 11, the third angel. Verse 12, the fourth angel. And you say, well, you're not, you're not telling us what's going on. That's exactly right. <laughs> I'm just telling you what's happening, not what's really going on. I'm telling you how the chapter is divided. And then verse 13, the saying of the flying angel. What you find here is the preparation for fire judgments, okay? You have the opening, you have the silence, the servants, the trumpets, the separate servant. You find the sacrificial altar, the censer of gold, the smell of incense, and the saints' prayers. Think about this. We are getting ready, right? We have, we have gone through uh, the four horsemen, we have gone through the seven seal, well, six seal judgments. The seventh seal opens up trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet opens up vile judgments. And so, you know what I mean? Just so that we get this idea, or it would actually be the thunders. And then after the thunders, which aren't mentioned, then the vials. But the idea is that we have, uh, we have gone through what folk thought was diplomatic, things that they had brought on nation against nation and fighting and, and uh, trade and embargoes and sanctions and stuff like that. And then they knew by the time that the, that the seventh or the sixth seal was happening, they knew that was of the hand of God. This has nothing to do with us on earth. Well, we're getting the idea now. This is bad. This is bad. But by the time you get here, this is horrific, what is taking place. These are every one of the trumpet judgments are judgments of fire, every one. 
Look at what takes place. A third part of the trees is gone. All green grass is gone. A third part of the seas are blood. A third part of the sea creatures are dead. A third of the ships are destroyed. A third part of the waters are wormwood. Many died because of these waters. A third of the sun is smitten. A third of the moon is smitten. A third of the stars are smitten. The days are shortened, and that would be apparently the daylight that takes place. Serious. This is what's going on. After the, the prayers of the saints, after the, the incense and the burning, and, and yeah, then there's judgments. And you see, then when folks say, oh, man, we're, we're already in the millennium, or we're, you know, man, we're living in the tribulation, you say, well, I don't understand. Is there green grass around you? Because if there is, there's no way that we're in the tribulation period. Are a third of the sea creatures dead or the waters become wormwood? And if that's not that we are not in the tribulation period, no, no, we are not, you know, and because, and then folks say, well, I mean, you had where, where Chernobyl, had, yeah, 20 years ago, tribulation period last seven years, we are not in the tribulation period, see, and, and you can just help folk and show them, say, man, look, this is what the tribulation period looks like. This is what it is. And uh, this, we have nothing like this going on today. I'm not going to be here for the tribulation. I'm saved. Amen. You know, and so that's what I write now for my conclusion when I'm going through and I'm preaching, man, you need to be saved today. Don't delay. You need to be saved today. Serious. Today is the day of salvation. Boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You have no idea what's coming. Uh, you, you need to be saved today. Serious. And I just, you know, this, and, and I'll just, I just go to town with it and just tell them this is what it is. And, uh, and I try to, well, the Bible says we're to put to silence uh, the, uh, the, the gainsayers and the mouths of foolish men. We're supposed to put to silence folk who would subvert houses. I want to put them to silence. So let's open up a Bible. Let's look at what God actually has to say and go from there. That's, you know, so there you go with chapter eight, that is. Chapter nine, we move on because I've not ever been uh, this far into Revelation with you. And I've got a long way I want to go, but I doubt we're going to get all through that. The trumpet judgments are continuing. Uh, so you just, uh, this is just uh, the idea of what's going on. You have the fifth trumpet sounding. And, uh, and this is going to be found in verses 1 to 11, okay? And what we find here is the sounding, the smoke, the tormentors, uh, the travail. In verses 7 and, and, uh, and on down, we see the shape, the sharpness, the sound, the stings that take place. Uh, this is the continuation of the fire judgments. And then in verse 6, I, it's just, it's horrible stuff. Then I went back and I put, you know, just for something to review over uh, what the seal judgments were, how they are effective, the, uh, then the trumpet judgments and what they are, you know, uh, so just so that we get the idea. And then I put down here in conclusion, verse 20 and 21, the rest left by mercy. Look, look with me. Uh, let's just see this. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Uh, chapter 9. Uh, yes, uh, chapter 9, verse 20 and 21, just so that you get the idea, because I mean, I'll, I'll help folk with this. Uh, the Bible says the rest that were left by mercy, yet repented not of their idolatry, neither repented they of their deeds. Think about that. Look at what it says. The, the Bible says, and th this is after, if you go back and you read in verse 18, uh, by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Look at what it says. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not 
of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils out of gold, out of silver and brass and stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Idolatry. After all of this, after the seven seals, after the fire judgments, and God has spared some folk, a third part of mankind is dead. You think about that. If there are 6 billion people on the earth, 2 billion people are dead. And the Bible says, yet repented they not of their idolatry. And then it goes on and it says in verse 21, neither repented they of their deeds. Two ways that men did not repent, their idolatry, what they worshipped, and their deeds, how they decided to walk on this earth. It says, neither repented they of their murders, or their sorcerers, or their fornication, or of their thefts. Just saying. Just so that we get the idea of what's going on. Let me see where we're at here. I think we're going to be in chapter 10. That was chapter 9. You get into chapter 10, and here's another way to, uh, to get this, uh, this idea of an exposition going. You know, just a way to take uh, some of the scriptures and rework uh, your thoughts on how to separate a chapter. Here we see this is a chapter of scenes and sounds. Scenes and sounds. We find here the scene of the mighty angel, and then a couple of sounds in verse three and four the sound of his voice, the sound of thunders, the sound of the voice from heaven. I and mean, when you think about this, and you get into chapter 10, after the fire judgments, it says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun. And his feet as pillars of fire, he had in his hand a little book open. He set his right foot upon the scene, his left foot on the earth, cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. I think that those are the seven thunder judgments that come after the fire judgments before the vile judgments. I mean, and I could be wrong. Who knows what they are, but that's just what I think. So I, I did this entire chapter as a chapter of scenes and sounds. There's some things you're going to see, and there are some sounds you're going to hear, like the sound of the mighty angel's voice, the sound of the voice from heaven. The sound of John, the mighty angel, and then the scene of the taking and eating of the book. And then the sound of the mighty angel to close out in verse 11. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And, and I'll preach about the book that John ate. I'll preach about uh, what it did and so, how it should be coming out, different things like that. So when you think of scenes and sounds, what goes on in your home? What kind of scenes are found in your home where you live? What kind of sounds are heard in your home? I, I took this chapter, and for this thought I put down, we, we know the scenes and the sounds that are taking place in heaven. We know the scenes and the sounds that are going to be taking place on earth during all of this tribulation period. It's, it's really bad. But let's bring it home and just ask you. There's, I guess, I think there's 13 folk participating with us in this. Well, let me just ask you, what does your home look like? What are the scenes that take place there? What do folks see you do? And let me ask you another question. What kind of sounds do people hear in your home where you live? What kind of things come out of the mouths of the people that live there with you and out of your mouth? 
might really help us to think about the scenes and the sounds that take place and come out of what we call home. Okay, just something to think of. Then we move on to chapter 11. See how I do that? I just leave it out there for you and walk away. Amen. <laughs> I hope you've got some, some good scenes and sounds going on at your house. This is where you have the two witnesses and the seventh trumpet. Whoa, right? Uh, verses 1 to 12 are the beginning of the, uh, uh, the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of what is going to take place, okay? Uh, this is where we see the measuring up, the two witnesses, and uh, you'll see the sizing up, things that need to be measured, right? Have you thought about this in verses 1 to 2, chapter 11? Oh, let's see. There was given unto me a reed like unto a rod. The angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and measure what else? Them that worship therein. Hmm. That's just something that you might want to bring out someday when you're reading and think about. Could you imagine an angel coming to measure you? I wonder how we'd measure up. I wonder how we'd size up if an angel from God came to measure us as worshipers of God. Because that's what it says. There was given unto me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple and the altar and them that worship therein. So I put the sizing up. And then the stamping underfoot to be done by the Gentiles last three and a half years, right? I mean, this is, it's just what's going to happen. So you preach it, man. And uh, so I do uh, this section here, the measuring, then you have the two witnesses, right? Verses 3 to 12, the two witnesses. And, man, you got, you got to think about this, <laughs> you know, because uh, I just, I put in here all, the, all this idea. They prophesy three and a half years. They're the olive trees, the candlesticks, uh, devouring the enemies. They have power to shut heaven, powers over water. Uh, but look here, they shall be overcome. They shall die. Their bodies will lay open. Check this out with me. I'll show you something. Like, I don't know, you know, but over here, we have, you know, Christmas. And folk are giving gifts and celebrating and singing and rejoicing. And you know what I mean? It's Christmas, right? woo -hoo! And all that. Well, look here. Uh, the Bible says... Verse number nine of chapter 11. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies, the witnesses, the preachers. They shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put. Let them lay in the street and rot. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Can you imagine that? Man, they're going to be so happy you are dead. Let their body rot in the street. Woo! No more preaching. Man, I'm glad those guys are dead. And then I ask folk I'm preaching with, how do you talk about your preacher? How do you talk about what they preach? Are you receptive of it or rejective of it? When the preacher that used to minister to your home to your wife, your husband, your son, your daughter, your mom, your dad, 
How did you react when they moved on? Were you all excited because you got rid of the preacher? Serious, something to think of. I just, I like to just bring it home, man. It's one thing to just preach the word of God, show people what it has to say. It's another thing if you can just bring it on home. How, how is the preacher uh, looked upon in your household? Would you be happy if he'd just shut up? Quit preaching about your sin. Of course, you're not going to say that. You're just going to say, I just sure wish he'd shut up. Wish he'd go preach on something else. I'm just saying. These folk here, when those witnesses die, man, they're, they're rejoicing. Let their body rot in the street. I am so glad we are done with them. And they are making merry and sending gifts. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. You ever feel loved? <laughs> I tell folk that all the time. I'm not here to be liked. That's what I tell them. I am not here to be liked. I'm here to love on you, to help you every way I can, try to be a blessing and encouragement to you, but I'm not here to be liked. You may not like me. You may not like half of what I have to say, but I really don't care. You know, I'm just... I'm just doing what I believe God wants done, okay? So then you have what is the beginning of the ending in verses uh, 13 to 19. You have uh, the signifying testimony that is given, the great earthquake, uh, a tent falls, the 7,000 die, folk get scared. Then you have the seventh trumpet where we have the voices in heaven, the four and 20 elders, you know, the temple of God. It's, I just put all these little notes in here to help, okay? And, uh, and then we go on to uh, chapter 12, because I'm going to try and get through. Uh, I only have 15 minutes, but I'm going to try and get through as much of this as I can. And I am so sorry that we missed that first part with the screen sharing. I really am. Uh, you know, but I, man, I really thought I had it good. Now, chapter 12, we're going to find... A different, see, this is why I wanted to bring this to you. I've showed you so far like four different ways to expound the scriptures. All righty, here's another way. And I'm trying to get these. That's why I wanted to go to this book in particular, because there's a whole mess of them that I used when I did this book. Here's another way that, that I felt like God wanted me to do this. Here, we look at chapter 12, and we're going to divide this chapter in our exposition into great personages of the Great Tribulation. Here we find a trip through time. This would be one of those parenthetical sections of the Bible. Okay? This would be a parenthetical section of the Bible. So here we have great personages. We see the woman verses 1 and 2, the dragon in verses 3 and 4, then you have the woman again in 5 and 6, you have the dragon again in 7 to 9, then you're going to have the loud voice, the dragon, the woman, then you're going to have the dragon, the earth, and the dragon again. So when you go back here and you're looking at this, and uh, and let me just move this a little bit, okay? Because it uh, it bothers me when my stuff is not on the right page. Sometimes my formatting comes out backwards. Uh, so you have the woman, and we realize that the woman is clothed with the sun, has the moon under her feet, the crown of 12 stars, being with child, cried, pain to be delivered. Who's the woman? Just something to think of. Then you have the dragon, the great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. You can preach about the horns, the heads, Daniel, the revelation that was given to him. You know, uh, then you have the seven crowns upon about how his tail drew a third part of the stars. That's the fallen angels. Just stuff to think of cast the stars to the earth, how he stood before the, to devour her child at birth. 
Then you find the woman again. There we go. This is getting, I'm sorry, it's getting better. Then you find the woman again brought forth the man child to rule. The child is caught up, fled into the wilderness. Her child fled in the wilderness to prepare a place where she's fed for three and a half. The dragon causes war in heaven, fights. Against. See what I'm talking about? These are great personages of the great tribulation. And it's a trip through time. It gives you an entire out. This is a big parenthesis in the word of God. Then you have the loud voice that's found. The accuser is cast down, how they overcame him by the blood and the word, love not their lives unto the death. Then we find the dragon again. Uh, we saw that he was cast to the earth uh, where he uh, persecuted the woman. The woman is given the wings, flies. She's nourished during the three and a half years. And I give you different little verses to the side, just thoughts to think of, things to draw your mind, uh, who the dragon is, how he cast out of his mouth water. What, what is that? You know, what is that? The earth, how did the earth help the woman? Opening her mouth, swallowing up the flood. The dragon, Roth, went to make war with her seed. It's a big parenthesis. It's a big historical statement about the word of God and about the, the combat of good and evil on the earth. You know, you pull that out. You try to help folk to see what is going on, what is taking place. Then you go into chapter, uh, let me just see, chapter 13. Uh, chapter 13 is going to be uh, more of the same. Let's do right here, chapter 13. I'm never going to get this in, but that's okay. This is more of the same. I'll try and just do it a little bit quicker and easier. Uh, here we go again. Great personages. It's more of the same of what we saw. Uh, chapter 11, uh, we saw the witnesses and the beast out of the earth. Chapter 12, the woman, the dragon, the loud voice. Now we're going to be introduced to two beasts. Okay. There's a beast out of the sea. And there's a beast out of the earth. The beast out of the sea is out of the earth is the false prophet. So then I give some scriptures to consider, places we can go and read. And then I'm going to break this up and we're just going to look at what it is. You have the beast out of the sea, the Antichrist. We see the description, the witness, the wickedness. We see the wound, the worship, the witness, the warring, the worshipers, the warning, and the word of wisdom. Then you have the beast out of the earth is presented. He's the false prophet. He's got the mouth, the might, the miracles, the misleading, the murder, the mark, uh, the market, and then the manly number, okay, the false prophet. And then I gave just a couple of verses to use and to compare with, okay? So I'm taking chapter 12 and 13, and we're still keeping uh, this idea of having an alliteration and going verse by verse, but the whole concept now is let's look at some personages. Let's look at, uh, at some entities that are going to be found in God's word. Some are past, some are present, some are future, some are all three just stuff to think of, okay, and uh, so that you get the idea, and uh, let's, because uh, I want to try and go through as many of these as I can with you, chapter 14, when you get into chapter number 14, uh, we have a few more of the, uh, of the great personages of the great tribulation period, so I go back, I list 11, 12, 13, in chapter 14, we see the Lamb, the 144,000, we see the harpers, the beasts, the elders, and the angels of judgment. Now, if you'll look at this, uh, give me just a second. I'm going to, uh, to move my, my stuff, because sometimes, like I said, when I get it saved, it goes off on me here. Okay. The events are in reverse order through verse 12. 
Then you have the patience and the blessing. Time seems to go backwards and that you have the 144,000 standing victoriously with the lamb before the gospel is declared and before Babylon is declared as fallen. Then you have the declaration concerning the mark of the beast and the judgment to come. The last part of the chapter deals entirely with the upcoming judgment at the close of the tribulation period and uh, the beginning of the millennial reign. So I give an exposition of the chapter. Let's take a look at it. And I just go all the way down through here, just one verse after the other. And I give them three main thoughts to consider. No matter what, as children of God, we are and will be found on the winning side. We will be. The gospel is us for us to fear, to glorify, and to worship Almighty God. And judgment is sure to come. See, and I will go through here and I will preach all, all of this. I'll preach my, my thoughts and ideas. I go through every single verse. I give these conclusional statements and try to preach from those. And when you get here and you think about this, that, that we are going to be found on the winning side, I have taken these and I went and I pulled out other verses in the Bible. Like, what shall we say then to those things if God be for us? Who can be again, right? Revelation or uh, Romans chapter 8. Then Psalm 118, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. And, uh, and in God will I praise, in God will I put my trust. I, I will not fear what, what flesh can do to me, unto me. And, uh, and then in Psalm 69, 56, I think it is, uh, for God is for me. So, you know, and just try to bring this out and preach. And then the, the message is to fear, to glorify, to worship Almighty God. So I go to John and I go to Hebrews and Revelation and Psalm 150. You know, praise you, the Lord, praise God in the sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power. Amen. And then about how judgment is sure to come, like Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, uh, the judgment. And then Revelation 20, I saw the dead small and great stand before God. The books were opened. And, uh, and on down through verse 15, and whosoever was not found written, the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Amen. And you just go down through here. See, there's, uh, you, you have to get the idea. Like chapter one was completely different from chapters two and three. Chapters two and three were completely different from chapter four. Uh, you have just a basic exposition. Now you have a pros, con, introduction, pros, cons, promises. Then you go into questions. I'm going to look at this chapter in the form of questions and, and you just keep working your way through. And uh, I just, I, I don't know, to me, it's just an easy, I wanted to give you guys a vast array of ways to look at stuff, okay? And, uh, and, and I felt like the very best way to do that is right here in the book of Revelation, okay? Because I know that here I have a whole mess of this worked out. So when you get here, I went back, I showed them, let's remember where we came from. I gave them basic idea of the first uh, 14 chapters. And then between the woe period stated above and chapter 15, it appears that we're shown the visions of time past, present, and future that we just look at, okay? Uh, so just look at the, the beginning of the ending, the preparation of the plagues, and the wrath of God. In verse 1, we have the sight, the magnificence of the messengers. Verse 2, the scene, mighty musicians. Verse 3, the sound the music of majesty. Verse four, the song, the message of the mighty musicians. See, these are all S's with M's. Then I continue the S's and I use O's afterward. The site, the opening of the temple, the scene, the outgoing of the angels, the subject, the overcoming, outgiving wrath of God, the smoke, the overflowing of glory. All of the uh, O's are followed with P's. You see the portrayal of the opening, the purity of the outpouring, the placing of the vials, and the product of judgment. Right? And I put down here for conclusion, judgment is sure, judgment is swift, 
and judgment is ceaseless. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to stop here because I've, I've tried to give you some things that would break it up and, uh, and show you some different thoughts and ideas. I've got three minutes left. So I want to do a, a well, I'm just, I'm going to do this here. Let's just see what we can do. I'm going to show you this uh, deaths. Yeah, see, it took it away. It sure did. Okay. Uh, let me uh, minimize this maybe. Close that. Screen sharing. It, it took it away from me. As soon as I did that, it sure did. Uh, that's all right. It sure did. Give me just a minute. Let me try it again. Because uh, I lost, I lost my whole. Well, guess what, guys? I lost my whole thing. Here it is. Here it is. Okay, let's try this again. There we go. Give me just a moment. I'm coming back to you. I promise. Share screen. So. I went back and what I do is I put together a sheet. This is the same thing on both sides, okay? So I can cut it in half and I get two sheets out of every piece of paper. These are the times that the word repent or repented or any kind of repent, repentance, repenting, any of that. But it's, these are the times that it's found in the Bible. You find here, chapter 2 and 3, these are all written to the churches. Repent, 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 repented not. Repent, repent, repent. And then I showed you verse 20, or chapter 9, verse 20 and 21, we read them. They repented not of their works, of their hands, their idols. They repented not of their deeds, their murders, sorcery, thefts. Chapter 16, we find repented again. They were scorched. They blasphemed God's name. They repented not to give him glory. They repented not of their deeds. These are the only times that the word repent is found in the book of Revelation. Right here. This is it. That's it. To the church, repent, 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 repented not. Repent, repent, repent. After that, there is no repentance. They repented not. They repented not. Neither repented they. They repented not. They repented not. Just thought I'd give that to you to think for a second, okay? Now, I'm going to do this other one while I think my thing is still working right. Just so you get the idea of deaths, I put this down. Uh, hang on, you probably can't see that. Let me just. There we go. You can see that, right? Yeah. This is deaths in the tribulation on that fourth seal, where a quarter part of the population is killed. Okay. The population, and you have to realize that this is what? 13 or 12 years ago, when I put this together, the population was just under 7 billion. Now, if that, re if the, if that revelation, that killing took place in one year's time, if you say, well, all of that death took place in a year, that's 18 million people a day. In order to get this population divided by four, that would mean that you would have to kill in a year's time 18 million people a day. 774,000 people would be dying every hour and almost 13,000 folk a minute. Now, killing that took place we're on the seal judgments we're not in the fire judgments we're in the seal judgments 
If that killing took time, uh, took place in a week's time, that's 968 million people a day for a week. That would be 40 million an hour and 672,000 a minute. So again, I'll tell you, we're not in the tribulation period, Fred. Okay, just so you get the idea. Uh, I like to just bring this up and help folks to see things, okay? I'm going to take just a few minutes, and I'm going to show you one other thing, and then I promise I will leave you alone, and we will get out of here, okay? Uh, man, no, I'll tell you, just give me, just give me a few minutes, just a few. All right, if you have to go, man, you go on because I don't want to hurt your, your family time, but I'm going to share this with you. Who or what or how is the dragon or Lucifer seen if you consider this to be Lucifer in Revelation chapter 20? So I put it down. You know, here's the verse. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. So we have the dragon, okay? He's called that old serpent. And I put this in here, the devil, a traducer, Satan, an accuser, a slanderer, Satan, the accuser, the devil. So we find that Lucifer is now described by God in this Revelation chapter 20. I believe it is. Yes. In Revelation chapter 20, he's described by God as that fascinating serpent, like artfully, uh, artfully malicious one that is the slandering false accuser. That's what these words mean. He is that fascinating serpent-like, artfully malicious one that is the slandering false accuser. That's who you battle. And then I'm going to do this right here with you. I wanted to share with you, and I may have done this with you before. Uh, I'm looking for it. This one's revised. So I think that this is the one I want to show you. Ah, and it did that screen pause stuff. Let me bring it up. Give me just a second. See it uh, there, screen share. There it is. Hey, man. See, I'm getting it, man. It's not going to beat me. <laughs> hey, man. It's not going to win. And uh, so what I did, did I ever show you guys this before? Revelation sevens. You see, in the book of Revelation, as you read and read and read and read, you'll find that there are sevens in the book, right? I mean, it's a typical thing. Seven churches, seven letters, seven spirits, candlesticks, seven stars, seven angels, seven lamps of fire, seven seals, horns, eyes, trumpets, thunders, heads, seven thousand people, seven crowns, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven right? Sevens. They're they're typical. Sevens. Well. Here's some things that aren't typical. How about seven times the word blessed is found? It's only found seven times in the book. How about the seven times the word sharp is found? How about the word prophecy? That's only found seven times in the book of Revelation. How about right hand? And he had in his right hand seven stars well it's found six other times i wonder what's in his right hand then how about the bottomless pit is mentioned seven times or how about this there's seven testimonies of jesus seven things you can find out about him in revelation chapter one and verse five how about over here, the seven sayings of the dead? How about seven types of men that try to hide? The kings, the great, the rich, the chief captains, the mighty, the bond, the free. How about how folk are unrepentant in seven ways? Remember, we read chapter 9, verse 20. It goes on. I mean, I've got all kinds of these, all kinds of these in here. There's more to the book 
than we get if we just read a verse out of it here and there or use a verse in a message somewhere. There's more to the book. And if we would take the time and read and read and read and read and read and read and read, we'll get stuff. We'll get stuff. The seven recipients of the mark of the beast. Who's going to receive the mark of the beast? All. Small, great, rich, poor, free, bond. The book of life is mentioned seven times in the book of Revelation. The word light is found seven times. Quickly is found seven times. And quickly refers to three things. Repent, judgment, and the second coming of Christ. So all of this stuff I've sent to him, it's recorded now probably if the recording's still going. And I'm very sorry that I kept you five, 10 minutes late. Let's have prayer. We'll get out of here. You guys enjoy dinner. Relax with your wife and kids or whatever you have going on. And uh, so let's pray and we'll take off, okay? And, and I want to thank you for letting me go over a few minutes and, uh, and staying with me uh, in, the, in the class, okay? Uh, Father, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, well, first of all, I want to thank you for showing me that the screen sharing had stopped so that I could try to fix that thing on my end and get it to work properly. And Lord, uh, I'd like to ask you to bless these men. I'd like to ask you to minister to them and to help them. Ask you to give them a, a really good evening ask you that you would give them a focus uh, for the service ahead for their ministries tomorrow. And I ask you, Father, that, uh, that you would bless them with their families and their health. Uh, I ask you to, uh, to bless the children, those that have children, their spouses. I ask you, Father, that you would just uh, meet their needs. And Lord, I'd like to ask you to bless with Dr. Pungshuk, that you would help him as he tries to just be a blessing and to help and, and try to gather uh, folk together so that we can have classes like this. Thank you. And Lord, I want to ask you to just uh, help that we all might be found doing things that bring honor and glory to your name and that we might be a blessing to others. These things I pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hey, hallelujah, fellas. You all take care. Have a fabulously Amen. wonderful day. All righty. And, and again, I want thank to you, apologize. Sir, thank, you, sir. thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. I want to apologize for going over. Okay. Please forgive me. <laughs> thank you so much, sir. All righty. Y'all take care. Yeah, you too. Oh, you too. Too. That's Rendo. Yeah, yeah, nobody take care. You're so good. Mm. Okay. Say bye-bye. Okay.